So let's now talk about the sources of feedback and recognize that typically when we're talking about performance appraisal, we often think about it in the framework of a supervisor or a manager rating employees or direct reports. And in fact, if we look across organizations, studies have found that 90% of all performance appraisals are done in this system. Um, they tend to provide evaluative results. Um, they tend to be focused on that decision making. However, that is not necessarily our best source of feedback or accurate source of actual performance. So recognize that even in the best case scenario, supervisors are only going to be getting a snapshot or a sample of the performance of that person. Who has access to all of that person's performance? Well, that would be this person themselves, self ratings. Now, self ratings, generally speaking, need to be only used for developmental purposes. We tend to be more lenient about ourselves. In other words, even if we know it's not gonna be used necessarily for decision making, we tend to rate ourselves a little higher than others would. Self ratings can be improved by making sure we use a relative scale. In other words, a bar scale will be harder for someone to actually um, inflate their ratings on compared to a graphic rating scale. And again, practice and in fact training, confidentiality of the rating, and also a focus on development in the future. All of those can improve self ratings. Now again, that gives us a second source of feedback. The supervisor doing a sample of behaviors, the self rating, noting, hopefully knowing all the behaviors, but also how is that person's behaviors perceived by their peers and their team members? And that's where we can get peers in on the feedback process. Peers tend to be more accurate at evaluating effort, not necessarily skills or the fine details of the job, but are they actually getting the job done? In other words, are they putting in the effort to where the peers are not having to step in to make sure the job's being done? Peers tend to be fairly good with reliability and validity of their ratings. In other words, generally speaking, we do find that peers tend to be in agreement in their ratings of other people. However, they're not necessarily widely used and the concerns here can be, again, confidentiality. So you have to identify who's being rated and you need to identify the peers that they would have. There is definitely a perceived friendship bias and this can definitely occur that if there are cliques or groups within the peers, in other words, if you have a team of 10 people and there's two people that really aren't good friends with anyone, and then there's three or four people that are work friends, and then there's four or five people that are best friends and they do stuff outside of work, they go to movies together, they go to bars together, again, you're probably gonna see that reflected in those ratings. Preferred, um, if we're using peers, again, we wanna make sure it's developmental rather than administrative. If peers know that the ratings they give are gonna be used to determine who gets the bonus, that is definitely going to add politics and bias to the system. And typically we find that when we get peer ratings, the top performers tend to rate more strictly and the bottom performers tend to rate more leniently. So just also recognize that if you have 10 employees and one of them is clearly a top performer and everyone knows it, they're probably gonna rate everyone else a little bit lower than they probably should. Likewise, if you have 10 employees at differing levels of skill and success in their jobs and one of them is a bottom performer, they're tend to gonna rate everyone as being a little bit better than they probably are. So just recognize that those are two things that can happen with peer feedback. So notice that we also have then subordinates. So those that you rate to rating upwards. Now again, there's some confidentiality concerns here as well. The whole goal though here is we're thinking is that again, depending on the purpose of your performance evaluations, you also want to actually ask, can I get as much information as possible? And the way you get more information is more sources of feedback. So ideally, the way we get rid of the individual concerns of any of these is we use all of them. We use supervisor ratings, we use subordinate ratings if appropriate, or customer ratings, we use peer evaluations, and we use self ratings. Just recognizing that they're not necessarily going to be perfectly in line with each other, but each one is giving us different information. Supervisors and subordinates and or customers are giving us a snapshot of behaviors. So what is the perception on the ground like? Self ratings is a more detailed understanding of what the person's actually doing. And peers actually getting a kind of effort and how the person works with others. And again, peers are probably gonna have more opportunities to observe the behavior than either supervisors or subordinates. So putting all of those together is where we get to the 360 degree feedback system where supervisors, peers, subordinates, and customers, depending again on the job and the interactions, will all rate the person to create a fairly detailed picture of the person's performance. 
So there are going to be differences in the self perceptions versus the others, but this is also something that can be used developmentally. So you perceive that you're doing this very well. In other words, your understanding of the job requirements and what you're doing, you think you're doing well. And in fact, objectively, you may even be able to prove you're doing well. But your supervisors and your peers are not seeing that performance. What can we do about closing that gap? So it actually can be helpful developmentally from that viewpoint as well. And the review of the results and the participation in the developmental planning. So again, 360 degree feedback is a part of a performance management system. It does require a fair amount of time, effort, and money to get the ratings and to coordinate the process, to then integrate it into reports, and then once you have the reports, to use the reports developmentally. Now, I've already mentioned multiple times, 360-degree feedback systems, when not used for decision-making, are probably the most reliable and accurate way that we can measure performance because we're incorporating the actual feedback and the perceptions of almost everyone involved around the actual performance. But, unfortunately, and here's the catch-22, you can't use it for decision-making or the whole process kind of collapses in on itself. Um, and all of those biases and problems come back that we've already discussed. So again, the problem with 360 degree feedback systems, time consuming for the raters, potential for re retaliation. So again, if you are getting ratings from your peers and you only work with four other people and one of those ratings is fairly low and fairly direct, you probably will be able to figure out who gave it to you. A lot of organizations will put the money into actually generating 360 degree reports, but then not follow through with the actual developmental meetings, the setting of goals, and the using it to actually make sure it's developmental. And again, probable, one of the biggest problems is that it's great for developmental use, but for all of that time and effort, it usually is not very successful for administrative use. Generally speaking, also 360 degree feedbacks, and think about it, if you've got 50 people being evaluated for 360 degree feedback and they work together. Each one of them is gonna to have to fill out a self rating. So there's 50 forms. Each manager is gonna to have to fill out a form for every single one of their reports. So let's assume there's five managers, each one managing 10 employees. That means that now again, each manager has to fill out 10 reports. Now each individual, those 100 individuals work with 10 others. That means that each individual, not only are they gonna to have to fill out a self-report, they're gonna to have to fill out peer reports on nine other employees. And finally, if those employees are working with customers and each one has 10 customers, you're also gonna ask potentially those 10 customers to fill out forms. So you can kind of see how there's a fair amount of time and effort and also just project management in getting all these forms out, then correlating it, and then creating the reports. A lot of times 360 degree feedback systems may, if they're implemented, be done by an outside organization that does external consulting, or may indeed be done by a department that this is all that they do. So making it work as much as possible, you wanna think of ways to make sure that the results are confidential. Um, and a lot of times what this can include is giving people the options to remove their feedback. And what that means, for example, is that you provide data on, for example, your supervisor, but before it's submitted, you were actually given a report that you were actually informed only two people filled out this particular set, which means that you are now one of two people that could be identified and you may then get the option to remove your responses. In other words, I was willing to give this feedback if I was one of 10 people giving feedback. If I'm one of two, the person's gonna know it's me and I'm not comfortable with that. So you wanna give options for confidentiality and you wanna be very transparent with people that may be giving data, information, feedback that might result in retaliation, the option to know what those chances are. You need to make sure it's developmental. You need to make sure that both the managers, the people that are doing this from the top down and doing the actual meetings to give the developmental feedback, to set the goals with the employee and the employees are buying in and have ownership in the process. You need to make sure top management supports this and is giving supervisors and the employees and everyone filling out the forms time on the clock to do it. You need to make sure that once you've got all of that, that it actually is well-constructed rating forms that are truly getting a performance. And that gets us back to that idea of job analysis. And finally, that you have professionals that are skilled in 360 degree feedbacks to summarize those data into reports 
to give guidance to the actual supervisors and how to set up those developmental meetings. So optimal performance appraisal, whether or not you're using 360 or not, probably involves all these components. You need to collect multiple observations. And ideally, if possible, you want to collect them from multiple people, 360 degree feedback. But even if you're not doing 360, the more people that can be making judgments, the more likely you're getting an actual measure of performance. Likewise, each person making judgments, the more observations they make, the more likely they're getting an accurate feel for performance. You need to train the raters at minimum of frame of reference training to where they use the scales that they are rating on successfully and similarly to other ratings throughout the organization. You wanna standardize the methods. In other words, everyone should be using the same forms with the same response options. Now those forms may change from job to job, but they should vary similar in their measurement. And finally, there should be some form of accountability for the actual raters. So if a rater is constantly rating their employees, their direct reports differently than everyone else, there needs to be some accountability, the potential of maybe even being moved out of that role. Again, any performance appraisal should follow as much as possible all nine of these points. It needs to be congruent with the goals of the organization. In other words, if we're measuring performance, that performance should be directly related to organizational goals. It should be thorough. If people are being appraised, they should be appraised throughout the organization. In other words, people shouldn't be getting a pass from this process. It does need to be practical. The costs need to be less than the benefits, and it needs to be clear why that we're doing these costs, why this time and effort is necessary, and what the benefit is. It needs to be meaningful, and by meaningful, it needs to be directly tied to, again, the job analysis and organizational goals, but also everyone should understand how this process results in actual behavioral change, bringing people more in line with top level performance. And a part of that is being specific. In other words, it shouldn't be focused on broad characteristics of the person. It shouldn't be focused on personality. It should be focused on specific behaviors that are directly tied to job performance. It needs to discriminate. So in some form, it does need to identify what is high performance versus low performance. Even if not being used administratively, you still need to be able to identify where you should be praising and where you should be training. It does need to be reliable and valid across the organization. And what this is, is again, getting at that frame of reference training. In other words, if my performance is getting me high ratings under one supervisor, it should get me the same or close to the same ratings on another supervisor. If that same behavior under another supervisor is getting low ratings, that's a problem. That's not a reliable measurement of performance. It's not valid. It needs to be inclusive. And by inclusive, it means that everyone involved in the process should at least have some voice in how it's being used and how it's being actually implemented throughout the organization. The people making the ratings and the people getting the ratings should both have some level of ownership in the performance appraisal system. And a part of that, again, is the final point. It needs to be fair and acceptable. And that's about perceptions as well. In other words, the people that are giving out the feedback should trust the ratings and understand them and understand how they're useful. And the people getting the ratings and getting the feedback need to at least understand what they're being rated on, how it's job relevant, and hopefully, again, be uh, good owners of the process to want to improve. So let's briefly end up with legal issues and performance appraisal. And again, there is EEOC issues in that a fair amount of workers will be probably in some protected class under um, equal uh, employment opportunity commission laws. There is an increasing number of lawsuits, and that is mainly because the, 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 the process of performance appraisal, even when done well, is still a somewhat subjective process, especially for complex jobs. It's one of the reasons when we talked about criterion last week, we talked about, when possible, look for objective measures. Objective measures are more defendable in court than subjective measures, but subjective measures may still be an important part of capturing what job performance is. Now, though there is an increasing number of lawsuits, I would also like to say that most of them end up in a, de a, a decree, a statement of decree. So basically, again, where um, uh, both or both parties agree to some form of litigation or mediation to result in the lawsuit being dropped and moving forward. So how do you create a legally defensible 
performance appraisal system. Well, Werner and Bellino in 1997 did an exhaustive look at all of the various EEOC cases that have been brought against performance appraisal systems and looked for common themes of what was present in the cases where the organization won. They were able to defend their performance appraisal system and basically show that they had acted appropriately and had not violated the law. So performance appraisal court decisions were evaluated from two perspectives. What factors were associated with decisions for the defendant, but also what factors were associated with um, uh, decisions for the plaintiff. And the plaintiff in this case would be the employee challenging the PA system. But both of those basically result in whether or not something was present or not and whether it predicted the success of the case. Now, this has been examined since 1997 and very similar results were found in more recent cases as well. So there were eight recommendations. Um, and again, this was found, um, Austin, Villanio, and Heinemann did this in 95. It was done again by 1997. And most recently, there was a meta-analysis in 2010. And honestly, I haven't checked since 2010. It would not surprise me if one of these researchers hadn't done a further follow-up study in this. So the first one is start with a job analysis to develop the criteria. So if an organization was able to show that the actual performance that was being measured was tied to a job analysis, this usually resulted in a higher chance of the defendant, the organization, defending its performance appraisal in court. If the performance standards were communicated clearly in writing, so that communication aspect, when that was there, more likely to be able to defend that performance appraisal. If the performance appraisal itself recognized separate dimensions of performance rather than one overall rating. So this basically rewards, if you will, or makes more legally defensible those performance appraisal systems that recognize that performance may be multidimensional. Now there may still be an overall rating, but if all there was was an overall rating, for example, you had a performance comparison system where a manager just ranked everyone from top to low, that would be an overall rating and nothing else. When you actually had measurements of multiple measures of dimensions that might then be weighted into an overall score, that was more defendable again in court. The use of both objective and subjective criteria. And this is interesting because it also means that the use of only objective data or only subjective data was actually associated with the success of the plaintiff, the person challenging the performance appraisal. The performance appraisals that were more likely to be found sound legally used both. And this again kind of probably is a mirror of that using separate dimensions. If there was an appeal process, in other words, when a decision was made, if there was a process, now this process just needed to exist for the employee to actually challenge and have that decision reviewed, that was viewed positively as the courts. If there were multiple raters involved, so the more people rating, the more likely the courts were to determine that there wasn't bias involved and it was an accurate measure of the person's performance that the decision was made. The more documentation that was available, again, documents showing the person underperforming. And finally, if there was training of the raters, um, if, at the very least, written instructions on how to conduct the performance appraisal. So again, the more structure there was supporting the raters and making sure that efforts were made to make sure the raters were not incorporating bias, the more likely that, case, that particular performance appraisal would be defendable in court. So these eight points kind of mirror what we're already talking about of what a good performance appraisal system should include. But this is another way to argue or to champion, if you will, to organizations the need for this. Because not only is it the right way to do it, it's also the more legally defendable way to do it.